Atkinson. So I will welcome them to the stream. Hello, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you connected. Um, can you, are you going to share, Martha, your screen? Okay, great. Martha is a machine learning engineering at Development Seed. Um, Caleb is a data scientist on Microsoft um, for Good Team. Hi, thanks so much for having us, Fosfergy. Again, my name is Martha, and I'm also presenting here this morning with Caleb about land use, land cover mapping. Um, so before we dive in, a high-level overview of why land cover mapping matters. Land cover maps are essential for conservation, climate research, and for environmental planning. There's so many organizations and researchers doing really impactful work with land use, land cover mapping. For example, a nonprofit called American Forests, one of their work is to understand how trees are distributed across urban areas in the United States and assign each urban area a tree equity score because unfortunately, trees are not evenly distributed throughout urban areas and sometimes there will be a higher concentration of trees and wealthier areas and a lower concentration of trees and areas that are not so wealthy and this disparity between tree coverage has huge implications for the residents well-being and happiness as well as the impacts of climate change and urban heat and the first step to understanding where trees are is to have a really accurate land use land cover map Additionally, it's really important to have land use land cover maps on demand and as quickly as possible because sometimes it can take years to create these really high resolution land cover maps, especially if field work is involved. But a lot of these applications and use cases need land cover maps as soon as possible or conditions on the ground are changing. So being able to update is really important. Um, especially with the availability of high resolution imagery at also such a high temporal frequency. So we would like to introduce a mapping tool called Perl. Um, we have this video of Perl playing in the background as I talk. Um, and what we're seeing here in a few seconds is live inference will be running um, with a nine class model over an area in Boulder, Colorado, which I'm from. Um, and we see here the tiles are starting to fill in. In this video, I didn't edit, so this is real time. Um, this area is about, I think, six kilometers. And we see that we're just running inference in just a few seconds, which is really exciting. It just kind of nicely fills in. And the model's doing a reasonable job. But this initial inference is just the starting point. We'll discuss this later um, in more detail, but you can also retrain your models in Perl. So if you want to make edits, you can, and then retrain the model, and inference will run again, as we see in this next video. So for example, users can also add new classes with Perl. All right, we have two starter models available in Perl, which we'll talk in more detail later on in this presentation, a four class and a nine class. But we understand that a lot of land use land cover mapping um, the classes that are important are really specific to different use cases, and we can't capture all of those, so we want users to have the flexibility to capture classes that are important to them and their applications. So we see here in this example, we can retrain a model and add a new class to capture more of the sand on the beach, and you can add a new class by using the Polygon tool or drawing freehand within the UI, and you can correct predictions if the model got incorrect, um, or add new classes. We're just adding more impervious surface for the roads and the buildings here. And then you can toggle retrain and new inferences pop up and you can see that there's been a little bit of improvement, especially along the shoreline. We're now able to capture some of the sand. Um, so at a high level, what can users do with Perl? Perl allows anyone to harness the power of machine learning to create a land cover map in the browser. To create this map, you don't need to be an expert in machine learning, nor do you need to be an expert in land use land cover mapping. You can just go and make the map. And a lot of these tricky decisions and architectures have been, have been abstracted away from the user, but there's still transparency in all the choices we made, especially with model metadata cards, which we'll talk about later on. 
Additionally, sometimes it's really challenging to access imagery. So within the browser, Perl gives users access to cloud-free to a cloud-free Nate mosaic, which is four-band imagery at 30 meter resolution. Um, one limitation of Nape is that it's only available in the United States. The four bands are red, green, blue, and NIR, um, and Nape is a product of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. For the rest of this presentation, we'll go through um, a little bit about the backend infrastructure of Perl, the models that are implemented in Perl today, um, inference and retraining, how users can validate and QA their maps, and future work we have planned for Perl. So, um, diving into the infrastructure, this is how the back end and the front end interact with each other. In this diagram, the client pool represents the UI, which users see. Um, the REST API load balancer allows the app to appropriately scale based on the number of users that are present. Um, it, we also have an auto scaling group for the GPU because inference is so fast because it's running on a GPU behind the scenes and it can scale um, with some limitations. We don't have infinite GPUs, but based on the number of users that are accessing the site at a given time, we use WebSockets um, to help communicate between the front end and the back end. And we're also persisting um, model inferences from a user as well as model checkpoints in a database so users can map and then leave Perl and come back in a few minutes, a few days, or a few hours and like pull up their map exactly as it was before without having to redo previous work, which is really exciting. Um, diving a little bit more into how our imagery is served, we use an open source package called ttyler to create and serve a cloud-free four-band NAPE mosaic. Um, for the models available in Perl, right now we have two models available in the tool, but more are being developed and will be released in the next month to two months. Um, the first model we have available is a four-class model that was trained on the East Coast of the United States. And then we also have a nine-class model that was also trained over the East Coast of the United States. And we have information um, about these models available in the UI, indicating their label sources, um, kind of a performance metric for all the classes, the F1 score, the years the imagery was from, as well as the imagery resolution. And this image is static, but in the UI, users can toggle over each of these bars to see per class F1 performance over the holdout test set, as well as the class distribution. Um, diving a little bit more into the model training data, it's really tricky to get high quality land use land cover training data. So we're really excited to benefit from the work the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab has done, the Chesapeake Conservancy, as well as the U.S. Forest Service for curating some of this really high quality land cover. They work with LIDAR as well as the NAPE imagery, and that's been really beneficial to use to train our models with. Um, for the starter models, we have four classes and nine classes, and both of those were derived from the NLCD label class data set, which is, um, I think, 13 to 17 classes. It depends on what region you're working with. Um, and as we'll notice, the, the four class model is an aggregation of the classes available in the nine class model. So it kind of just depends um, what's best for the user. Sometimes if the user has really specific class requirements, it might be easier for them to run that initial inference with the four class model and do retraining and add classes um, in that works with their use case better. Um, in terms of model architectures, we've experimented with a few different ones, including FCNs, UNETs, and DeepLab V3. There's definitely um, pros and cons to each of these. The models we have today in the tool are FCN, but future models are gonna be more Deep Lab V3 based. Um, and our modeling was powered by open source tooling, including PyTorch, SMP, and a package Caleb and his colleagues have worked on called Torch Geo. Um, some of the modeling challenges that we faced are regional generalizability. So how well can this model that's trained on the East Coast do if we wanna inference on the West Coast or like in the Southeast United States, 
We certainly can run inference, but there's definitely a little bit of a drop in performance, but that's where retraining comes in and can hopefully help address that. But in the future, we hope to provide um, regional specific models to kind of cover the whole US well. Um, another big issue we faced is class imbalances. This is an example of a seven class model that's currently in progress. And we see here that trees, as well as grass and shrub, are the most prevalent classes, while, while bare soil and water make up about 1% of the data set. But for other areas, bare soil makes up less than 1% of the data set. Um, other areas, water is a fairly common class. It just kind of depends on what geography we're working in. But to try to address this, we have used focal loss during training, which has helped. And we're also exploring other data augmentation techniques to address this and get better performance across all classes dealing with this imbalance. Um, so again, we're really excited about running inference with Perl because it runs on demand in the browser. Um, so we see here again, this is just a little bit um, sped up. And kind of all the infrastructure that Perl is running on is backed by Azure and Microsoft's planetary computer. Um, I'll hand it over to Caleb for him to discuss retraining. Yeah, thanks, Martha. Um, so a, a large key feature of Perl um, is it's uh, allowing users to kind of interactively fine tune the model uh, that sits behind this uh, kind of infrastructure that Martha was talking about. Uh, so after you run inference with uh, your model, you can kind of interactively look at the predictions and find where the model's making mistakes, uh, and then add training points through a points, polygons, you can even upload your own uh, GeoJSON file that has label masks in it. Um, and those points are then used combined with the imagery to fine tune the last layer of the uh, kind of underlying convolutional neural network that's making the predictions. Uh, and this is an iterative process. So after you've um, looked, uh, corrected the errors, fine tune, uh, it might be making new errors, uh, it might have corrected a little bit of some class and still needs more corrections on another class. Uh, so iterating over this retraining uh, step allows uh, kind of users to get to um, the performance that they want. Uh, another kind of key feature that comes about as a retraining is the ability of users to add new classes. Um, so if you add points uh, like Martha was showing earlier for a sand class, uh, then the model can on the fly learn to uh, disambiguate sand from uh, say barren. Uh, the Perl interface allows users to save these trained model checkpoints. So after you do a bunch of work in getting the model to the point where you want it, uh, you can save it and come back for later. Uh, and then, of course, there are other nice bells and whistles here, like uh, the ability to undo uh, points that you've added or uh, kind of erase erase work. Uh, so this slide just shows what one iteration of this process looks like. Uh, so we have the imagery over here on the left-hand side. Uh, so this is the high-resolution NAPE imagery, like Martha was saying. Uh, the initial model uh, has some confusion now in this imagery between uh, the shadows and uh, the water class. So it's classifying things that are in shadow as water. Uh, that's obviously something that we don't want. Uh, we would rather classify that as impervious surface. Uh, so after, uh, I think, just two or three iterations of this retraining process that I was describing, um, you get uh, the output over on the right. I think we have a video here of what this looks like in pseudo real time. Uh, here, the user is adding in a, or correcting a structure class, uh, and then it warps ahead to after the retraining is done. Uh, you can see over in the right hand side of the screen that uh, the F1 score for the structure improved. Um, on the technical side, uh, what's going on is the models generating a per pixel uh, embedding. And then those embeddings are aggregated with whichever uh, form of supervision you're using, whether like points, polygons, uh, and whatnot, to create a, a sort of table of um, pixel embeddings and then associated pixel labels. Uh, those tables are used to fit a logistic regression model. Um, this happens kind of very quickly on the CPU, and the weights are copied back to the GPU at inference time. Um, so everything everything happens pretty quickly. 
And I think handing it back over to Martha now. Oh, yes. Um, as we've already kind of discussed, you can add a new class via retraining. In the lower left-hand corner of the UI, there's this plus sign, and it says add class. Um, users can really go wild with add class. You're not required. You can add more than one class per retraining iteration if you want, and that class will be persisted through subsequent training, retraining iterations. And this is kind of a static view of adding sand, as we saw, and it's led to some improvement right along the coastline. Also, um, once users are satisfied after they've retrained, they can share their work by downloading a GeoTIFF of what's rendered on the screen, or they can create a shareable URL. Um, but before they share, users want to feel really confident in how their model is performing and understand it quantitatively as well as qualitatively. So we have an analysis panel in the UI of Perl that hopefully helps users on their way to that level of understanding. So after each inference as well as after each retraining, there's a class distribution per AOI that's kind of the top level bar graph. This is showing you what percentage of pixels are water, what percentage of pixels are trees um, for each of the classes present to the model. And then something that's really important is understanding, is retraining helping the model? Is it leading to increases in performance? So we also have available F1 scores for every class. And these are calculated by, so when the user is drawing a polygon um, or using the building polygon box or the freehand tool, a random number of points are sampled from that geometry and submitted to the model for retraining. But we hold out um, about 10% of those points as like a holdout test set for retraining. And that's where we're able to calculate the F1 scores to understand how retraining is helping the model. Um, so you can compare between different checkpoints to see what's going on with those. Um, additionally, you can use Perl as a very sophisticated paintbrush and refine predictions in the UI. Um, in the same kind of tab, you can use the refine tool and you can use Perl like a paintbrush basically. So for example, with this artifact we see in the upper left-hand corner um, on the first image, the model got confused because there happened to be a boat flying, not flying, a boat um, going through the water when the nape imagery was like taken. But really, um, even though it's like white and the boat is technically an impervious surface, um, that's not what the land is underlying. Like the land use class should still be water. Um, so sometimes those small changes, it's too much, it's like too tricky to capture them with retraining or it's just not worth it um, if you can just circle but retraining is still very straightforward. So sometimes it's faster to just use the refine tool and do some edits to clean up before you export your final map. Um, so going into a little more, we are really excited about Perl, but we're most excited about how it can help real life users, especially for conservation applications. And we discussed this a little bit in the beginning of the presentation, but we're just beginning um, an initial partnership with American Forest They've already done a lot of work for identifying um, and quantifying urban tree canopies and understanding tree inequities, but they're trying to scale this work to make it be US wide. So we're hopeful that Pearl can become part of their workflow. We're working with them on a pilot for five cities currently. And if that goes well, we would like to help facilitate um, expanding their work across the US using Pearl. Um, additional future work we have planned is integrating Perl with OSM data. This will allow users to pull data from OSM for faster retraining. We're actively working on developing more geographically diverse regional models. Um, in a future change, there'll be um, a big addition, but something we're really excited about um, is exploring, expanding imagery access beyond NAEP to use Sentinel imagery so model land use land cover models can have global coverage. Um, yeah, we really would invite you to try out Perl. It's freely available. Um, it's backed by open source software, as we've all discussed. Uh, and you can access it at landcover.io. Sign up and start making some maps and let us know how it goes. Um, additionally, Perl is a huge team effort. 
So I'd like to give a huge shout out to many of the DevC team members that were involved listed here, as well as our friends at Microsoft um, and everyone else who's helped us with Pearl. So thank you so much. We're super excited to get to talk with you guys, and we look forward to answering questions. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was uh, really interesting and clear. It looks like the software works really nice. I really liked uh, the brush that you can just <laughs> help to these little changes that sometimes it's very, very difficult to automatize. So that was a funny tool. Uh, let's check uh, with the questions. Oh, we have a lot of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is Perl an open source project? Um, currently, the code is not open source, but it will be soon. OK. Are the models pre-trained or users train them online with their data? The models are pre-trained, but users can bring their own data during the retraining step if they want. OK. Can anyone access Perl? It was. Yes. It seems like. OK, great. Um, Okay, let me check. How does Perl deal with cloud abstraction? We don't have clouds because our <laughs> mosaic is magical. Um, it was specifically created using an open source software called ttyler, and the ttyler code is available. So if you wanted to make your own mosaic for other work, you certainly should use ttyler. Um, but our mosaic is magical and combines different years of Nape imagery to create a beautiful cloud tree layer. Yeah, I can just expand on that as well. Um, if anyone's not familiar, NAPE is uh, aerial imagery that's captured by the USDA over uh, different states in the US. Uh, they captured it on different cadences. And they uh, specifically work hard to make sure there are no clouds in the imagery. Um, so Perl uses a mosaic of state-by-state -state NAPE, uh, NAPE imagery. OK, thank you. Uh, are there any future plans to develop Perl to work for countries outside the US? Yes, definitely. Once we integrate Sentinel imagery in with Perl, it will work wherever there's Sentinel imagery. Okay, great. And also, any Northwest US trained models? Not right now. Okay. Um, let me check. I think all of them are the same importance. Can you export the inter inference outputs from Perl? Yes, you can. We can actually go back in the slides. Maybe you can export them as a geotiff, um, or you can get a shareable URL link. Where did I? Yeah, it's right here in the UI. So, cor uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Martha. There's like a, a maximum size AOI that you can draw at the beginning of sort of your mapping session um, that kind of restricts the, the geotiff that you'll get back to, to something of reasonable size. You, you're not going to draw a box over the entire like US um, and expect to get something out there. Yeah, that's correct. We're currently working on getting it to be a little bit bigger. Um, right now in production, it's about 100 kilometers. But when we release next week, you might even get more area. Great. That, that was actually one of the questions. So you also answer it. That's uh, a great question. Yeah. Um, and also, does the retrain model get registered, redeployed for others to use? And is there a quality acceptance threshold for that? Currently, you can only access models within your user account and not share them between other users. Um, but every retraining checkpoint you save is persisted and you can access it. So if you retrain like three or four times, you can save a checkpoint at each of those retraining steps and work with it again. Um, sharing checkpoints between users is something that's also scheduled for in the future, um, but not possible right now. So it's kind of up to an individual user to determine their acceptable quality thresholds. OK, uh, there is uh, one more question. Can Perl perform temporal predictive analysis? 
Right now, no, because we're only running inference over the same mosaic of imagery. But something that will be available in the future is you could select a specific year of native imagery instead of working with the mosaic. So that's somewhat of a temporal analysis. Um, but NAEP happens about every two years. Is that correct, Caleb? In different um, areas around different cadences? Yeah, from, from the, the software side, uh, I, I, can, I can jump in and say that it's super cool the way that Perl runs inference straight off of uh, kind of the T Tyler output. Uh, so if you do have um, a mosaic that's served through T Tyler, then um, theoretically that, that can be hooked up at some point in the future. Great. Thank you for all your uh, nice answers. They were all very clear. Um, there is a lot of enthusiastic uh, future users in the chat. Um, they are really looking forward to use it. And there is also um, a question about the risk of introducing rear artifacts if you're using cloud stripping model to produce the mosaics. Uh, We're not using a model to get rid of the clouds. I feel like I misspoke. NAEP doesn't really have clouds inherently clouds. because of how Caleb explained it. The mosaic isn't based on a model. It's just based on aggregating different years of this data together. So we have smooth coverage of the entire United States. Great. OK. Thank you very much again. Uh, uh, I say goodbye to, to all of you. It was really nice to have you here. And uh, we will continue with uh, the next talk. So uh, thanks so much. You. Thank you. Bye.